Thank you. That concludes the debate on trade, Australia and New Zealand Bill UK legislation. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 8209. In the name of Edward Mountain, on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee on the role of local government and its cross-sectoral partners in financing and delivering a Net Zero Scotland. And I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move the motion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this debate on the Committee's inquiry. <clears throat> I want to thank the many people who contributed to it, especially the councils and their local partners, partners from business and the voluntary sector, <clears throat> who hosted the Committee on its four visits to Stirling, Dundee, Aberdeen and Orkney. I also want to thank my colleagues on the Committee for their marathon efforts in this inquiry, which lasted over, over a year. Not only did the committee take a lot of evidence, it covered a lot of bases. Everything from the intricacies of a multi-million pound green finance deals to whether tree pres preservation orders are fit and were fit for purpose. It was a truly a multipolar inquiry informed by expert opinion from a variety of disciplines. Now, by the time I joined the committee as convener in September last year, the bulk of the evidence taking was complete. And I saw my main role as to ensure we kept on top of the mountain of evidence we'd accumulated and came up with a report that was less a compendium and more a succinct call to action. To separate the wood from the tree preservation orders, as it were. I hope we succeeded. I think it is a truly excellent report with a small number of clear general messages interspersed with some more granular recommendations. I, knew, I know too that it's been welcomed by local government, who I expect will be keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary says in response to today. Now on that note, it is perhaps a little disappointing that the Scottish Government was not able to re reply to our report before to be today's debate. If it had done so, we might have been able to push the discussion on a little further today. But I do look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say and his contribution. The committee embarked on this report recognising the importance of local government uh, as a layer of democracy closest to and most rooted in our communities and the heft that this gives when it comes to preparing for net zero. For instance, in taking place-based planning decisions that are truly reflective of local needs. Another strength of councils is their unique convening power the power to get different interests around a table and to be a catalyst for positive change in climate change and indeed in all other areas. On that note, it is important to stress that our report is as much about those partnerships as it is about local government itself. The committee uh, agreed our report unanimously in a spirit of consensus and that is important. And I hope this constructive spirit can be sustained in today's d debate with a pragmatic focus on the question, where do we go from here? I pose this against the backdrop of our headline finding, and that was that we are unlikely to make Scotland net zero by 2045 unless we have more empowered local government sectors, a sector with better access to the skills and capital it will need to play a full role in this energy revolution a sector with clearer understanding on the specific role the Scottish Government wants it to play in some of the key delivery areas. But this is not a council of woe. Good progress has indeed been made in many areas. The committee was inspired by the work that many councils are carrying out with their local partners in the business and voluntary sectors in areas such as EV charging, reuse and recycling and renewable energies. There are case studies in the report, but overall, councils feel underpowered and are struggling to deal with the pace of change required by the net zero transition. To paraphrase the evidence of one specific council leader, it is hard to work to think strategically about carbon, your carbon footprint when you, when you are wondering how you're going to fill potholes and keep schools open. 
It is a real problem. And this isn't simply the debate we're all used to having about council funding. It is hugely important. In the report, we call on the Scottish Government to provide additional support to councils in future budget cycles to help them contribute to the national net zero targets. But there is also a knowledge and a skills gap, as the councils indeed themselves recognise. The net zero transition means unprecedented and, highly, and often highly technical demands are being made on local government resources and skill sets. So where do we go from here? I'll set the scene, I believe, by mentioning four key recommendations, knowing that others within the committee may want to expand on these or other ideas they have in their contributions this afternoon. Firstly, the Scottish Government needs to provide a comprehensive roadmap for delivery of net zero in key areas, one that gives councils more certainty than they have right now about the roles they are going to have to play and the leadership they're going to have to provide. This applies in several areas, but I will single out heat in buildings as one area where progress most needs to be made, yet where councils are at least sure of their role and at least certain that they have the right tools and resources for that role, whatever it turns out to be. Secondly, and complementary to that first recommendation, for the government to create local sorry, local government facing climate intelligent unit to provide help to councils in areas where in-depth specialist knowledge is lacking. One of these areas where this assistance is most needed is in securing help with green finance deals from institutional investors. Just about everyone agrees with this uh, and, it's and the fact that it's going to be necessary if we are to have any hope of meeting the 2045 target. But this is specialised and very high-valued work. The rewards are potentially great, but the level of financial risk is equally high. We also want to see the Scottish National Investment Bank more active at, at the interface between local government and private finance. Thirdly, we call for a review of the Scottish Government challenge funding streams for net zero related projects. We want to see larger, fewer and more flexible funds to avoid the needless bureaucracy and perverse incentives that we heard can bedevil the current system. Fourthly, we call on the Scottish Government to address the churn and delay in the planning system, which has a chilling effect on the investment in all areas, including renewables. We also need a strategy to address long-term decline in the number of people employed in council planning departments. But there are some areas where councils could do more to help themselves. An Accounts Commission report last September found inconsistency in the level and depth of strategic planning for net zero by councils. It also found that councils were not generally thinking enough about mitigating measures and addressing residual carbon. This was largely corroborated on our own inquiry. We think that many councils need to do more to show they're working and demonstrate how they actually propose to reach their targets. Councils will find this work easier if they can tap into the enthusiasm of their own residents. This was underlined by the evidence from the Freiburg Council in Germany, a global leader in municipal level net zero planning. The witness was very clear that the city's success was largely due to the engaged and, poli and the politically literate local population who constantly kept the council on their toes. To put it differently, net zero should, be, should not be a, a centralised project, but it should be something that people and groups can help shape, lead and deliver on. This has been well understood uh, by Patrick Geddes, the father of modern town planning, much of whose work was done not from uh, far from this building. Long before the modern environment movement was born, he understood intuitively that the best and most sustainable solutions are usually low impact ones that are decided locally and not imposed from far away. So, think globally, act locally is a mantra of the modern environmental movement, but it was a message at the core of his philosophy and it is at the core of this report. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my, in my name and I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate.
Thank you. And I now call on Michael Matheson, up to nine minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I begin by uh, taking this opportunity to thank the Committee for their time and effort in undertaking their inquiry and into producing this very detailed report. I also want to put on record my thanks to those who, organisations and individuals who presented written and oral evidence to the committee over the course of the inquiry. The report itself, as the convener rightly says, is wide ranging and I believe that speaks to the very vast complexities and challenges in delivering net zero. It is also unquestionably timely. Our national climate change targets, uh, as passed almost unanimously by this Parliament, are our collective responsibility. Both national and local government have vital roles to play and have a shared responsibility in leadership and delivery on them. That shared role is evident across the range of climate change policies which have been highlighted within this particular report. Despite uh, positive progress today, I fully accept that we need to do more, not least in light of the recent analysis on Scotland's progress from the Committee on Climate Change. For that reason, we welcome the inquiry and the report. The recommendations articulated make, uh, I believe, what are much for us to agree upon in moving forward. Key to that will be exploring scope for greater partnership between all levels of government, not least in terms of how we can use our funding together more powerfully. An example of where we are looking to pool our efforts is a proposal for a climate intelligence service, which was also one of the key recommendations from the inquiry. This service would provide all 32 local authorities with the data-informed evidence, insights and intelligence that they need for continuous improvement of their climate change plans. It would also help with the development of the skills and knowledge to equip local authorities to take more climate-informed decisions. I am pleased to inform the Chamber that we are currently in advanced discussions now with COSLA in setting up this service. And I very much hope that the service will be in place soon. I also agree with the committee about the vital role for communities in our just transition to net zero. And I accept the need to promote models of community engagement and to take a place-based approach to that. This is already happening through participatory budgeting, where local communities decide democratically where funding should be invested. For example, Dundee City Council has launched a £750,000 fund to support climate action, with local people determining which projects to fund. And in the North East, as part of our Just Transition Fund, we've allocated at least £1 million funding every year over the life of the fund to support participatory budgeting projects aimed at addressing a just transition to net zero. The report rightly focuses on how local action can be coordinated and galvanised to support our shared net zero agenda and what Scottish and local government can do to support this. Climate action pubs have been at the heart of our approach on this. I'm happy to give way to Fiona Hislop. Fiona Hislop. I was listening carefully to what the, the Cabinet Secretary was saying, and he described the place-based approach as participatory budgeting on a localised geographic area. The report itself, however, recommends that place-based is not just about the pursuit of public funding, it's about coordination of all partners in a place-based approach. Cabinet Secretary. I very much agree with that. And one of the actions that we have been taking forward, as I mentioned, is through Climate Action Hubs, which is about helping to lever in public and private finance, but also helping to coordinate and bring together communities in order to help to direct support and assistance within their local area. And to date, we have supported two Pathfinder hubs to do exactly that. Both hubs 
are community-led organisations which were launched back in September 2021, one covering Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, and the second covering Highland, Orkney and Shetland. The hubs have provided that strategic approach to enabling community-led climate action. They have focused on building awareness of the climate emergency and community capacity through training and events. And they have been able to widen participation with an impressive 40 per cent of the groups engaging in the Highlands being new to climate action. The hubs have directly supported community organisations in developing projects, including on community energy, retrofitting, reducing flooding risk and green skills, while helping secure funding from public and private investments. And the hubs have also offered an opportunity to build on existing support and ensure coordinated action. And I have been encouraged by the positive feedback from a number of local authority colleagues looking to support the programme. So, President Officer, I want to build on this progress and the interest that local authorities have stated to date in building on this. That is why I am delighted to announce that we will now expand the programme to provide a national network of hubs. The Scottish Government will commit £4.3 million in the 2023-24 budget to support the expansion, and we will in turn, we anticipate in the region of 20 hubs being developed based on conversations with communities to date. A national network will drive a place-based approach, putting communities very much at the heart of the transition to net zero. And the inquiry also specifically highlighted the need to promote community engagement on local heat and energy efficiency strategies. I will give way to the member. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. I appreciate what he is saying about community engagement. That is a vital subject that I think we can all agree on. But the report very clearly states, which resonates with me, because one of the, I asked the First Minister a question about this last year sometime, the, the fact that the Scottish Government needs to give clear guidance to local authorities. And there is a very important sentence in the executive summary of the report, in the report's conclusions, in fact, about the importance of councils receiving additional resources in the run-up to 2045. Otherwise, the net zero objective will not be attainable. Would the Cabinet Secretary comment, please, on those two principal aspects of the report, the need for clear guidance from the Scottish Government and the need for additional resources? Cabinet Secretary. The first of the points in terms of guidance, yes, but that's guidance that needs to be developed in partnership with local government, not top down from government, which was the impression that the member gave. And that's very much the approach that we want to take. And of course, the uh, intelligence unit is one of the routes in which we can actually help to achieve that type of intelligence and uh, guidance that is needed for local authority colleagues. And of course, with additional funding, I, I would like to be able to give local government uh, more funding to support them in this area of work, but we work within a limited budget. Uh, and we have to recognise that if we are to put more money into local government, then it has to come from somewhere else within a fixed budget uh, settlement. But of course, where we can, for example, through the, uh, the community hubs that I've mentioned, we are putting in additional investment in order to help to support the expansion of community-based approaches. General Officer, as I was mentioning on local heat and energy efficiency strategies, these are strategies, again, which are at the heart of what I believe is a place-based approach, which are locally led and also tailored to approach our need to meet our heat transition. The strategies are aimed at setting out the long-term plan for decarbonising heat in buildings and improving energy efficiency across the entire local authority area. And they will support local planning, coordination and delivery of heat transition across communities, helping to target investment where it can make its greatest impact. We also want to... The I'm Cabinet Secretary must asking. conclude. I'm conscious of time, Presiding Officer. Do I have to...? You do indeed, Cabinet Secretary. Okay. Apologies. Um, we also have to continue to work closely with local government uh, through a recently established Heat Network Support Unit which is designed to address what is a key issue that some of our local authority colleagues have in developing what are local heat networks, and that is being able to carry out some of the pre-capital stage development work, which is absolutely critical to supporting them in taking this work forward. I hope, Sign Officer, in responding to a couple of the points that I've made in the course of my opening comments, 
that members can be assured of my firm commitment that we build on the existing partnership we have with local government to support the development of what is a new deal to achieve better outcomes for people and communities, especially on national priorities such as climate change. And I very much look forward to hearing and engaging with the debate this afternoon and to making sure that we deliver on our shared objective of creating a new deal for climate change with local government. Thank you. I now call on Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the outset, let me begin by thanking the clerks to the committee and my fellow committee members uh, for what I agree with the convener is a very good report. It is also a considerable piece of work. We took all of 12 months over it. We had written evidence <clears throat> from 63 stakeholders and we went on four council visits. And what we heard was that local government and its cross-sectoral partners will play a fundamental role in Scotland's transition to net zero. And indeed, already are. For example, on our visits we saw the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub, a partnership between Aberdeen Council and BP. We saw Aberdeen Community Energy, in which residents of a local housing development pioneered an urban hydropower scheme, and I declare my interest as a shareholder. Uh, Dundee Council's partnering with business to provide EV charging points, sustainably powered by solar panels and batteries. Orkney Council's fabric first approach in affordable new build housing. And just yesterday, Jackie Dunbar and I visited the Ness Energy from Waste plant, funded and progressed innovatively by Aberdeen, the Shire and Murray Councils. But this innovation and further development requires the Scottish Government to step up, to which end the committee made various recommendations. And perhaps the key overarching one is offering uh, the strategic plans and clarity of direction of travel that councils have been crying out for. Indeed, Aberdeenshire Council told us in their response a major barrier is understanding what various paths to net zero would look like in practice, which is why the committee was absolutely right to call, a call echoed today in a submission by COSLA, on the Scottish Government to produce a comprehensive and detailed roadmap yeah. for delivery of net zero, one that gives Council certainty about their roles and the additional resources and powers required to deliver what the government asks them to, one that allows them to assess the cost and operational implications of options and assess what ultimately represents the most sustainable, optimal strategy or course of action. Because with that, councils will then be able to assess the expertise and experience required to carry out the strategic planning and data gathering and source the leadership needed to promote and embed best practice to mainstream net zero planning into council decision making that the committee also recommended. Because that strategic planning is not easy. Stirling Council said we need help with strategic planning so we can understand our priorities. Then we need help to develop the resource and skills to be able to deliver programmes. So that roadmap would allow strategic hires and planning, but also merits the Scottish Government carrying out another committee recommendation, the creation of a local government facing climate intelligence unit to provide specialist help where a local authority might not retain it or be able to afford it itself. In which regard, of course, I'm very pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary's remarks on this and that discussions are advanced with COSLA. And that roadmap would have positive impacts upon skills because with that clarity on the work available and the timescales involved, businesses will have the confidence to invest in the new skills and training required to meet Scotland's targets. And presumably the colleges will know which courses to scale and be better able to work with business to put on apprenticeships or assist in a transition. Yeah. Now, of course, all of this needs to be financed and a much more informed and strategic approach to financing needs to be taken. For example, the Scottish Government's heat and building strategy was said to cost £33 billion to deliver. But when I asked the Minister Patrick Harvey what that figure is, about 18 months later, adjusted for things like inflation, he's unable to tell me. And he will not have a revised estimate until after the planned heat and bu buildings bill consultation, which is ridiculous given the tight timescales that we are working to. And it is trite that whilst the full extent of that 33 billion cannot come from public funds, an element does need to come from the Scottish Government. WWF Scotland suggests capital investment by the Scottish Government would need to increase between, to between two billion and three billion pounds per year from 2025 to 2030, which is worrying. 
as we know that this government promised 1.8 billion over the lifetime of this parliament yet by january this year had only spent 155 million pounds less than 10 percent of what was promised and the committee also asked that the scottish government be smarter with funding so Cosler's gail mcgregor told us to empower local government councils need not just increased funding but also larger fewer and more flexible funding streams in which regard it is notable that the uk energy research center found that a one million pound investment in each of the 32 local authorities in scotland to provide technical assistance for energy efficiency and renewable energy investments could produce investment finance on affordable terms of around 1.2 billion pounds and then the scottish government needs to get better at leveraging private finance indeed the University of Strathclyde told us that there is a reluctance to engage private funding bodies on leveraging the appropriate scale of private sector finance to supplement available public funds, which worryingly looks set to continue with the Scottish National Investment Bank saying all the right things about working with local councils to support the transition to net zero, yet telling the committee the bank has been established to invest on commercial terms and it is unlikely to be suitable for the needs and requirements of local authorities funding which is why the comments of the likes of the abi are so interesting as they told us that the insurance and pension sector want to invest in net zero initiatives and have the capital to do so but they need consistency in how these opportunities are structured mm -hmm. and a long-term business case for example in short the very roadmap and proper expert resourcing that gives investors confidence that the committee called for as its key recommendation and that i highlighted at the start of my remarks presiding officer this committee found that there is an awful lot of good work going on at local authority level despite serious challenges that will no doubt hear about as the de debate develops and through extensive evidence taking the committee has set out some really practical solutions that the scottish government could take now to help local authorities to help communities deliver on our net zero ambitions which is why it is disappointing that there has been a failure to respond to this report, report despite the urgency of the subject matter despite the report being laid on the 23rd of january and despite all the representations that have been made to us all since then presiding officer the committee has done its job looking at the role of local government and its cross-sectoral partners in financing and delivering a net zero scotland and i hope that in response to this report we'll see the scottish government do the same thank you Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call on Colin Smith, around seven minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the members of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for carrying out this inquiry, the many organisations and individuals who gave evidence, and the committee clerks and researchers for their work distilling that evidence into the committee's excellent report, a report which makes an important contribution to the debate on how we get Scotland on track to meet our climate commitments. As the report stresses, our local authorities are crucial to that journey to net zero. As the biggest employer and service provider in Scotland, as a major owner of land and buildings, councils will have to lead by example, cutting their own carbon footprint. Many of the services our councils provide, from transport to housing, from recycling to care of our open spaces, will also be key in supporting communities to play their part in tackling the climate and nature crisis. But our councils are more than the sum of the services they provide. They are who we look to for leadership in our communities to build the local partnerships that will help enable us all, households and businesses, to cut our carbon emissions and meet our common goal of a transition to net zero and, crucially, make sure that is a just transition. However, they can only do that if we properly empower and properly resource our councils. And, President Officer, we are failing to do that. In budget after budget, the SNP and Greens have hauled out local government, stripping £6 billion from council budgets in the past decade. And as the STUC said in their evidence to the committee, the most recent Scottish budget has further entrenched cuts to local government. This needs to be reversed. The Net Zero Committee were clear in their report. 
Our councils need additional financial support in their core funding and a more strategic approach to dedicated net zero funding, ending the fragmented, short-term, time-consuming bidding wars we see from challenge funding. Although the government have, yet, have not yet bothered to respond to the committee's report, in their response, COSLA made the point, and I quote, local government does not have the core flexible resources it needs to develop local net zero programmes and climate resilience. We need to urgently simplify funding of national programmes so that there are fewer challenge funds and more larger multi-annual funds. Yeah, I'll certainly will, yeah. Stephen Kerr. Oh, we'll get extra time for him putting his card in, is that okay? There is some time in hand, Mr Smith. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr Kerr, are we sure there? We will Stephen Kerr. do that at some point. I've just done it. Um, does the member agree, though, with the report which says that the clear message of the inquiry is that no amount of additional government funding is realistically likely to bridge the gap between the current reality and our national net zero ambitions? And then it calls for things to be done to access private investment. Does he, in short, agree with what Liam Kerr said earlier in his speech about the need for a clear route map that unlocks this private investment? Colin Smith. The point was well worth me and waiting for. I have to say, it's a point that COSLA made in their recent response to the committee's report, that the government does have no overall costed coherent roadmap to net zero by 2040, or arguably the more demanding target of a 75 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030. That was also the conclusion, I have to say, of the Climate Change Committee in their recent report card on the government's performance. The chairman of the committee, Lord Debham, said one year ago I called for more clarity and transparency on Scottish climate policy and delivery. That plea remains unanswered. The Climate Change Committee report was damning. Seven out of 11 of our increasingly at-risk legal targets missed. Targets, they say, are in danger of becoming meaningless. Progress in cutting emissions has largely stalled. On the three big emitters, transport, heating buildings, land use, the report card was a clear fail fail, fail. A view, I think, largely echoed by the Net Zero Committee's report. Take transport, a largest source of greenhouse gases, responsible for a third of our emissions, with levels barely below those of 1990. Yet the government's response has been to axe 90,000 train services a year, propose just 2,000 more public electric vehicle charging points when we need 30,000 by 2030, and to cut 120 million bus passenger journeys since 2007, as they dismantle our bus network route by route, with more cuts likely when they end the Network Support Grant Plus at the end of the uh, month. If I've got time, I'll happy to give away. Brian Hussle. Very grateful for Colin Smith giving away. Would you agree with me that this disproportionately hits rural areas much harder than the urban areas? Colin Smith. There's no question that the, that the cuts in support for bus companies will hit rural areas more. They are, they are the more heavily subsidised um, part of our, our network scheme. And what really frustrates me is that nearly four years after this parliament passed the transport bill, the government are still dragging their heels on giving councils the powers as secured in that bill, and more importantly, the resources that our councils need to deliver publicly owned local buses to start to put passengers, not profits, first. President officer, if we also want to see the lack of commitment by this government to a just transition, we need to look at the way they and Glasgow City Council have treated Glasgow's taxi drivers when introducing the low emission zone, failing to adequately support them to make that transition, which will force many out of business or into unmanageable debt. And if we want a just transition, President officer, when it comes to the second biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, our buildings, which account for a quarter of emissions, we won't get that by cutting the energy efficiency budget by £133 million, instead of tackling why the poorly designed schemes are not being utilised, including the area-based schemes administered by local authorities, given the shocking levels of fuel poverty in Scotland and knowing that properly insulating our homes not only cuts fuel bills but cuts fuel use and therefore emissions. We need to see more clarity and certainty for our councils, homeowners, landowners and crucially supply chains through early publication of future regulations for heating and energy efficiency. That regulatory framework needs to sit alongside an effective enabling framework, learning from effective retrofit examples across Europe, where, for example, one-stop shops are emerging, providing the end-to-end -end management of the retrofit and installation process for the homeowner, from access and information on options to getting quotes to engaging contracts. And, presiding officer, even in those areas 
where we have made good progress in cutting emissions, such as energy production, we have not only not seen a just transition with many of the supply chain opportunities going overseas, but that progress is now under threat because of the long-term decline in the number of council-employed planners. In my own region of Dumfries and Galloway, eight out of the last 11 wind farm projects taken to the Scottish Government's Planning and Environmental Appeals Division were due to a failure to decide the application locally within the required four-month timescale, primarily due to a lack of planning staff. President officer, the clock is ticking towards our net zero targets, but the Government does lack a clear plan. The urgent actions needed to meet those targets, to ensure we play our part stopping this climate crisis becoming a climate catastrophe. Our councils are key to meeting those targets, but we need to start to give them the powers, the support, the resources and the respect they need to help us deliver that greener, fairer Scotland that we all want to see. Thank you, Mr Smith. And I now call on uh, Willie Rennie. Around six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I want to thank uh, Edward Mountain and his committee for producing a very substantial report. And I think, actually, unlike I have to say some committee reports, I actually think this will help in the longer term and it will hopefully bring some clarity to a very difficult situation because change is hard. You know, we wouldn't be here discussing it years after the, those world-leading climate change targets were set in 2009 if it wasn't hard. So except these are challenging circumstances. This is the, the biggest change probably since the Industrial Revolution, and it's, if we're going to get it right and get that just transition, then we're going to have to make sure there is a proper plan that works effectively, because the Climate Change Committee were very severe in their criticism, and I'm sure the Minister uh, would accept that. They said climate change targets that have been set by the government are in danger of being meaningless. Meaningless. These were have gone from world-leading climate change targets to potentially meaningless. That should really worry us all, and that's why I think this report is really helpful, and it will hopefully bring some, some clarity to the situation so we can have that roadmap that's been uh, frequently talked about today. Now, there are, I think, a number of very strong competing priorities that have been set by government, and some of these are very difficult to resolve. So take, for instance, homes. We all know there's people in our constituencies who are desperate for a house. They're absolutely desperate. They're either overcrowded or they're staying with relatives or they're just in a house that is just too small for their needs or is very hard to heat. Now, those people are desperate for a home and I'm desperate to get houses built. But the challenge is, how efficient do you make it? Because the more efficient sometimes you make it, the more costly it is to produce the upfront cost. Of course, it's going to be a longer term benefit and it will keep the, the fuel bills lower for the longer term, but the upfront cost is, is higher. So therefore, it's going to cost us more to do that. These are the kind of challenges that council officials and councillors are facing every single day. And they are in, also in danger that if they put too great requirements, greater requirements on developers, that those developers might put their money somewhere else. They might build houses somewhere else in another council that's perhaps not as strict. And if they're going to meet their housing requirements at the same time as meeting their climate change objectives of having energy efficient homes in the right place with the 20 minute neighbourhoods in the right time, finding the right land, all of that is really quite challenging. But if you look at the same with energy schemes, you know, we've got big challenges on biodiversity and where do we get the stock from, but also low cost and dealing with the climate as well. Transport's got the same challenges. So on finance, on the immediate needs, on long-term climate and biodiversity needs, and also through life costs. All of these are massive challenges that we've got to try and resolve. I'll take an intervention. Brian Huzo. Very grateful for William Rennie to give, give away. Would you agree with me that as a parliament, we need to start looking outside of the a parliamentary term and start making long-term strategies that will, that will be more likely to deliver net zero? Willie Rennie. Yeah, I wish we could do that, but you know, the nature of politics is we want answers now, don't we? We want to get results immediately. Of course, people are desperate for urgent action, but too often it is too short action. I'll give you an example. Now, it's a slightly old example from about four or five years ago. There's a proposal to build 1,400 homes in the north side of Cooper. 1,400 homes. It's been debated for a long time. 
Housing development in North East Fife, I think, has stalled in part as a result of this scheme being caught in a quagmire. Now, there's a local sustainable Cooper development group who were desperate to have a district heating system attached to these 1,400 homes. So we spoke to the developers and they said it's experimental, it's too expensive, it's got long-term obligations, we want to build the houses and be out, and we're not required to do it. We don't have to do it, so we're not going to do it. We went to the council and said, you've got the power to make them do it. They said, we don't really know much about district heating systems, it's a bit risky, perhaps a bit expensive, and we want the houses to be built, so we don't want to scare the developers away. So we went to the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Government said, no, we've got schemes, we've got funding schemes, we've got pilots, but it's really up to councils to resolve this. Now, I hope the situation has improved since then, because that buck passing means that we don't have a district heating system for Cooper. In fact, we don't even have really the answer as to whether a district heating system would be the right scheme for Cooper North. So I think that's why it leads to the point of having, uh, in a second, we, it's, it, that leads to the point of having the right advice, the right laws in place, the right compulsion, and empowering local councils to be able to bring all of that together to make it work so we can progress. We'll take an intervention. Mark Roscoe. Thank you, for giving way. I mean, I'm aware of the discussions in Cooper around the heat network, but that was largely happening before the heat network's legislation was brought in place. So would you accept that there's now greater legislative certainty around the frameworks around heat, and it's a better, more investable proposition now for developers to introduce these networks? Will you? I mean, have, having plans is fine. But how do you deal with that risk? Who takes the risk? Do they have the money? Do they have the incentive? Do they have the competing priorities that they're addressing? Of course, they want to get these houses built. They want to get them built as quickly as possible. And if developers say, no, it's too much of a responsibility, we're not going to do it, we're going to build somewhere else, we might even not even build houses anymore, we might go somewhere else. That's a challenge that I'm not quite sure we've resolved it. And I hope that that has changed, because the kind of quagmire that Cooper got stuck in is astonishing. Because just down the road, as Mark Ruskell will know, because it's in his region, there, is, there was a proposal for connecting up the district heating system, the biomass plant for St Andrews, built by St Andrews University, 100 yards away, is a new persimmon development. Now, the university and the developer had a discussion about connecting it up, but they said, we don't have to do it, there's no requirement, so we're not going to connect up. And they put in gas boilers instead in these houses. We're supposed to be moving away from gas, but we've got gas boilers in these brand new houses right next door to our district heating system. We could have connected up, but there was no requirement. Now, that was post the new frameworks that the, the member talks about. If you look at solar panels, um, businesses were required to get, I probably should conclude, um, businesses were required to pay extra business rates for solar schemes on their, businesses, on their, on their roofs um, for above 50 kilowatts. They were also required to get planning permission. In England, that wasn't the case. Now, the minister responsible has just changed that. But why has it taken so long to get some of these really simple things in place so we can provide the right incentives? So we need the people, we need the expertise, we need the roadmap, we need councils to be able to do more than their statutory duties to make these big changes in order to make sure that we do meet our climate change obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. Um, uh, before we move to the open debate, I would advise members that at this point we do have some time in hand. Uh, so, uh, if members wish to make and or take interventions, uh, and I call uh, Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Alexandra Stewart. Around six minutes, please, Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the NZ Committee, I'm pleased to speak in my first committee debate today. I think this is the first time since I've joined the committee that, that we've had a debate to chamber. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the clerks my committee colleagues and all those who participated in the committee inquiry. Without their input, this inquiry and our recommendations would not have been possible. All the challenges that have been highlighted during the NZ Committee's inquiry are made even more acute during the present cost crisis. For example, the evidence we took shows that there is no doubt and I know this as a former local councillor, that the increase in inflationary pressures that are being experienced by local authorities will have an impact on their ability to deliver on the important net zero ambitions. 
Indeed, successive Scottish budgets has demonstrated this Government's commitment to the centrality of a just transition to a net zero and climate resilient Scotland. The 2023-24 budget prioritises a just transition to a net zero, climate resilient and biodiverse Scotland with over £2.2 billion of investment in 2023-24. And the Scottish Government has allocated £194 million this year to help to reduce energy bills and climate emissions through the Warmer Home Scotland area-based schemes and Home Energy Scotland. Presiding Officer, Scotland's ambitious climate change legislation sets a target date for net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045. And progress has been made and Scotland is more than halfway to net zero, but it still has much to do. Our inquiry heard how we are now entering the most challenging part of the journey to date with a need to halve our emissions again by 2030. It's not going to be easy. The next full climate change plan will show the emissions reductions of the economy-wide policies in the plan, as well as detailing other benefits like job creation and the costs of the policies. And the transition to net zero will require a truly national effort from all sectors of the economy, including significant private sector investment in net zero and climate resilience to ensure the long-term strength and competitiveness of our economy. Central to this, and you're not going to be surprised to hear me say it, is a just transition for the northeast of Scotland, including in my Aberdeen Donside constituency. But in order to fully make this transition work, our evidence shows that the UK Government must also take action to secure a just transition. The UK Government's own Green Jobs ta Task Force recommended they set out how they will match support available through the EU's Just Transition Fund. Unfortunately, this has still not been acted upon. The UK Government has still to match the Scottish Government's £50 million Just Transition Fund. And I again today... Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. When the member calls for the UK Government to match uh, the Just Transition Fund, does she think that the £16 billion North Sea transition deal goes any way since it's 32 times the size of the Scottish Government's funds to meeting that criteria. Jackie Dunbar. Well, but this, uh, this UK Government has taken £300 billion from the northeast of Scotland um, through the Treasury since the 1970s. So if you're going to start matching, matching funds, Mr Kerr, no, I... Um, I, today I'm going to call on the UK Government to ensure it plays its role in ensuring we achieve a just, just transition and match the support available through the EU scheme. It's vital that we all take responsibility and all do our bit. One of the areas I have an interest in and that our inquiry covered is green skills and getting young folk into green jobs. Tackling climate change is not just about government policies or investment, and there's a significant role for the whole of Scottish society in supporting transformation, transformational change. We heard how Scotland's skills response to climate change needs to be a national endeavour. An agile, aligned and responsive skills system will be vital to the delivery of a green recovery. The scale and pace of change needed across all sectors will demand a significant realignment of our investment in education, training and work-based learning towards green jobs. Scotland already has many of the skills required to facilitate the transition to a low-carbon economy. And these skills exist across many of our established sectors, such as energy, engineering, construction and chemical science. However, the Scottish Government must take a range of actions to support the development of green skills. The Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan is central to creating a future workforce that can support our transition to a net zero economy and ensure workers are equipped with the skills that employers will need in that green economy. Our inquiry shows that the Green Jobs Workforce Academy is an important step in achieving this and will help folk of all ages assess their skills, identify skill gaps and access upskilling or retraining courses. Alongside the Just Transition Plans, the Scottish Government is developing a pilot of skills guarantee 
guarantee offering folk in high carbon jobs support in moving into good green jobs. Presiding officer, one example of the role local government and its cross -sec sector partners are playing in financing and delivering a net zero Scotland is the joint working of Aberdeen City, Aberdeen Shire and Murray Councils who are working collectively together to finance and deliver a new energy and waste plant. Just yesterday, as Liam Kerr already mentioned, we visited the energy from waste plant in Aberdeen, a plant for unrecyclable waste so that there is no longer a rel reliance on landfill. I was involved in the project from the beginning when I was a councillor, so it was great to see the project coming along and nearing completion. And once completed, it will hook up with the local district heating network and help reduce fuel poverty in the local community. In closing, presiding officer, I again welcome the steps the Scottish Government has taken to tackle the climate emergency, while being aware there's still a way to go. And I look forward to hearing other contributions today. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Barr. I now call on Alexander Stewart to be followed by Paul McLennan. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be able to contribute to this debate, which highlights the vital role local government can and must play in the journey to net zero. As the level of government that is closest to our communities, councils are best placed to deliver the local flexibility that will be required in order to achieve the Scottish Government's net zero targets. We know that many councils are aware of the challenges facing them in this area and COSLA has set out very clear that local government is committed to delivering both for 2030 and 2045 climate targets. However, presiding officer, COSLA is also clear that despite this commitment, local government's ability to contribute towards these targets will be seriously limited without the increased investments that councils require. As we have already heard today, the issue of funding is one that comes up time and time again when it comes to local government's climate responsibilities. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the report by the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee states that the issue of local government finances is one that remains and one of the main issues raised within the inquiry. Numerous individual councils who responded to the committee's inquiry also made it clear that insufficient funding is one of the biggest challenges they are facing in this area. Presiding officer, this should not be a debate entirely focused on local government funding. However, it is clear that yet another area of local government performance is being compromised by underinvestment. The committee's report reveals that council's planning departments have shrunk by over a third of staff have been cut since 2009. The Town Planning Institute has also highlighted that planning authorities are now struggling to recruit staff at the same rate that individuals are retiring. To this end, the committee report is right to support the creation of apprenticeship scheme for planners. The Scottish Government should continue to work with the Royal Town Planning Institute as such a scheme should be endorsed. However, the skills challenges facing our councils go far beyond the planning department's presiding officer. Indeed, the issue of skills is one of the biggest hurdles we face in retrofitting buildings net zero inclusion to switch to low emissions or zero emissions heating systems as such as heat pumps. One of the biggest issues that we see uh, is that that has to be maintained. Uh, for example, there are areas within Scotland that are trying to achieve this. Stirling Council has worked with the Scottish Water Horizon and to create a district heat network which powers most of the fourth side of the Stirling area. This is an example of exactly the type of cooperation and collaboration between local government and external partners that we need to see if we are to achieve these targets. It is still clear, however, that the retrofitting journey is one of uh, faces significant skill challenges as it goes forward. So much so that numerous stakeholders, including Homes for Scotland, the Scottish New... new, 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 new no have suggested that both 2030 and 2045 targets are not realistic. The Clean Heat, Energy and Efficiency Workforce Assessment produced by Climate Exchange has set out the scale of the challenges that we face, presiding officer. The report estimates that in order to meet the 2030 target, Scotland will require at least 4,500 
a thermal insulation installers, up to 12,700 heat pump installers, and up to 4,000 heat network installers. These are massive numbers, presiding officer. The Construction Industry Training Board has highlighted that the Scottish Government's heat in building strategy has not provided a clear pipeline of the work for the construction industry. This means that the industry still lacks the confidence it requires to ensure that the workforce is ready and willing to take forward. Given that amount of housing stock that local government is responsible for and being able to access contractors is vitally important, these skills challenges must ensure and must be met and ensure that jobs are tied back. And I hope that in the summing up, the Minister will at least acknowledge this is one of the big issues that requires to be challenged. It is also true that there are real ambitions about what we want to do in this sector, but these ambitions can only be managed if there is the possibility and responsibility of local government and government itself working together. Together we must challenge and we must ensure uh, that there are real areas for development and skills delivery review has come forward with many strategies about where we go. Presiding officer, as we know, Scotland's government must do more to achieve a net zero target. We also know that it is unable to achieve these targets unless government is able to play a massive part in the journey. Councils must be empowered to fully invest in their own climate initiatives. This means giving councils investment and also ensuring that they require the skills and the workforce that is there to move forward. And all this means supporting councils to deliver local strategies towards net zero as much as is humanly possible. In conclusion, presiding officer, unless there is a step change on how local government participates in the journey to net zero by 2045, targets will not and will cannot be achieved. The onus now is on the government to act and to empower local government before it is too late. And I hope that the minister and government take heed of the warnings that we put out today. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr McLennan. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm delighted to speak in this debate this afternoon. Can I thank the committee for its support? I think it's an excellent summary of what we need to do, and I commend the committee on the report. Scotland will not meet its ambitious target of being net zero by 2045 without a strong partnership with local government. Local authorities can lead on skills, and we also need access to capital to play a full role. And I'll touch on that later on. It's clear that both Scottish Government and local authorities need to understand their roles in key delivery areas. Now, the committee launched the, the report recognising the crucial role that councils will have to play if we are to become a net zero nation. Now, I'm saying that with 15 years' experience as a councillor also. Now, with local knowledge of workplace, supply side and skills base, uh, skills base councils are in a good position to engage well, with local and national stakeholders as part of what will must be a collective national effort to reach net zero. The support is as much about those partnerships as about local government itself. Just yesterday, I spoke on the subject with my chief executive, the local authority, as I said, just talking about this quite extensively. One of the first key tasks is to establish pipeline. What exactly does each local authority need to do? Now, in East Lothian, I started an energy forum, which has now met four times, looking at the, the, the uh, planning, looking at financing, skills and supply side issues. This has an extensive stakeholder engagement and looking at skills agencies, supply side agencies, developers and the council itself. Local heat and energy efficient strategies are, and area based approaches need to be published by the end of December 2023. Now, that implementation plan should address how LHEs will be used to help implement the local area based approach that will be necessary if there is to be real progress on the issue. Council's role in relation to district heating systems are also key and need to be clarified. Now, the Local Government Committee, of which I am a member, took evidence on retrofitting and previously held a debate on this issue last year. Clear evidence from the supply side sector was that they needed to see a clear pipeline prior to substantial investment. The quicker local authorities arrive at that point, the better. Now, to do so, councils need to set out strategic planning and targets around about that area. The committee calls on the Scottish Government to work with COSA to audit the effectiveness of Council's net zero related planning, strategic planning and data gathering, which again is really important and of where a lot of local authorities are going through at the moment, and to promote and embed best practice in mainstreaming net zero planning into Council decision making. I do not think we are quite at that, that point also. 
Uh, the Local Government Committee also spoke to the Council Commission on that particular issue, and they have a role in ensuring that Council strategic planning and major budgetary decisions are consistent with net zero goals in promoting climate change budgeting. Now, I am sure the, Cli the Accounts Commission will come out with more detail on that later on this year. There are key areas in that strategic planning, be that of funding, skills, powers and direction. The Committee itself called on the Scottish Government to heed the, the Climate Change Committee's call for a comprehensive and detailed roadmap for delivery of net zero in key areas, such as heating buildings and in transport. Now, Scottish Government are in discussions with COSLA at the moment regarding a new deal. Any such deal and associated reforms must comprehensively address how councils are to be supported in delivering on net zero. We also need to develop investment stream. The challenges of attracting private investment needs to be approached by adopting area-based approaches, offering potential to scale up opportunities. And we heard the figure Liam Kerr mentioned of £33 billion earlier on. Now, the Scottish Government is looking to be put aside £2 billion, but the rest of that gap needs to be filled by institutional funding. There are billions of pounds out there. I spoke to some uh, professor from the London School of Economics who highlighted that there are billions of pounds out there, but the real challenge is to develop investable scale-up uh, projects. And that's the challenge to local government and Scottish government to work on in that regard. So scaling up, risk management has been touched on in coordination, are key in this regard. But the Cabinet Secretary also mentioned around about the flexibility in funding, and we need grown-up discussions between UK Government and Scottish Government to allow targeted additional borrowing powers to allow the Scottish Government to help local government in that particular matter. On skills, the inquiry has identified planning, procurement, building standards and environmental assessments as being amongst the areas in which such assistance is likely to be most needed. Now, in East Lothian, it is one of the smallest uh, local authorities. To try and scale up to that scheme will need help in, in that regard. So, COSLA and Scottish Government need to work on securing specialist advice and assistance to local government and its engagement from institutional investors on major capital funding. The role of Scottish National Investment Bank and the Scottish Future Trust in relation to area-based uh, schemes uh, need to be discussed and was in the report and needs to be explored further. On procurement, local supply chains need to be developed. This ties in around about establishing pipeline, which I mentioned earlier on, at an early stage, a local level. We are already engaging in, through our energy forum with local supply, the, the, um, the supply side developers at the moment, seeing about what they need to do to try and grow the businesses in East Lothian. Local authorities need to lead on developing that supply side growth that is required, and they can do that now. On planning, the committee was concerned about delays in, in applications for renewables, and I think that is a valid point at this stage. On NPF 4, the committee asked the Scottish Government to consider setting up a short-life working group on renewable energy within the planning system, including representation of local government, the planning profession and industry to speed up the process. The Local Government Committee, of which I am a member, I said before, will be undertaking this period, period of work. We will be measuring that, and I think one of the key things that has not been mentioned before is obviously as well as the discussions that we have been having with the RTPI. Now, the RTPI have been discussing with the Minister around about an addition a need for 7 to 800 planners across the planning authorities. That needs to be monitored and the Local Government Committee will be carrying that out. If we are achieve, to achieve net zero, we need a fully resourced planning system to meet demand and growth. The committee uh, also raises a grid capacity to keep in touch with the planning applications for renewable projects placed at risk. And of course, discussions around about that need to be advanced much quicker with the UK Government. Transport and active travel are all are, are other policy areas which we could talk about at length. President Officer, in summary, this report sets out what we need to do. Strong partnership principles between local and Scottish Government. Establish pipeline at an earliest opportunity. Local energy skills partnerships, resource planning system and create investable streams matching up projects of scale. We need to achieve net zero by 2045. Of that, there is no doubt. In doing so, we can empower our local communities to deliver this, not only for their local climate, but for their local economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McLennan. I now call Monica Lennon to be followed by Natalie Don. Ms, uh, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, I am pleased to be taking part in the debate this afternoon. As the convener set out in his remarks, this has been a significant and substantial inquiry spanning 17 evidence sessions where we heard from more than 50 organisations. It is right that we got out of Parliament and visited a number of communities 
who are at the heart of delivering on Scotland's net zero targets and ambitions. And I was pleased to, uh, to get out of central Scotland for a couple of days, and I was part of the delegations both to, to Aberdeen and to Orkney. And it was really worthwhile and grateful to everyone who made those visits possible. I was, here to, I was pleased to hear Willie Rennie and other colleagues today uh, acknowledge the importance of this report. And we would not have been able to produce the report and the, the key recommendations without Peter McDade and the committee clerking team, Spice and everyone who played a part. And it's been good to follow my, my committee colleagues uh, today. Um, planning has been mentioned already, but if you'll indulge me as a former planner, I do want to focus on that. Because in terms of the place-based approach, which our deputy convener, Fura Hislop, has been so passionate about, and in terms of that place-making agenda, planning is absolutely key to that. And I'm pleased that colleagues have been reading the briefing received from the Royal Town Planning Institute of Scotland. Because we have seen a real significant decline in not just the, the number of planners, you've heard some of those statistics today, but that capacity to deliver at a time when demand is increasing as a parliament, you know, we've all bought into National Planning Framework 4, we've had planning reform, so the, the, the demands are really high, but we need to create that opportunity, retain really good planners, but create that pipeline for, for new talent. And while we were taking evidence uh, in the inquiry, we're quite a dynamic uh, committee, and I'm looking at the deputy convener because we didn't just wait to get to the end and do the report. So we used you know, parliamentary questions and other devices to, to ask government as things were progressing. So I was really pleased that the planning minister, Tom Arthur, was very uh, optimistic and very positive about the opportunity that a planning apprenticeship model could bring, because we have that in England, so we can look at that to see how it's going. But given that we um, have been um, losing a number of planning schools over the years, planning schools will become an endangered species in Scotland. So we have to create new routes and the planning apprenticeship would be a really exciting way to do that. So I'm glad that other colleagues have championed that um, today as well. And it looks like something really good is going to, is going to come from that. Um, as well as planning, another key area for local government was procurement. Um, procurement um, is not yet fully aligned with sustainability. Net zero is not fully are firmly embedded across all council directorates and budgets. And the Sustainable Scotland Network acknowledged that more work is needed to align council procurement with net zero. But they said that the problem may lie upstream of procurement, um, including at the specification stage. So the network was keen to, to do more, to provide training and build capacity. And again, that's another key area for, for government to, to look at. Um, I want to jump across to, to transport because, as we heard from the convener, you know, we're trying to find local and national solutions to a global crisis. You know, we're living through a climate and nature emergency. Um, the cabinet secretary uh, and his ministerial colleague has heard me talk about this before, but the X1 bus, which used to serve communities in Hamilton to get to uh, Glasgow city centre, you know, quickly and efficiently, that's a service that we lost in the pandemic. And I want our young people who have now got their free bus pass to have a service like that once again. So we know from not just our report, from the Climate Change Committee's strong words that we need to do more to decarbonise transport. We need to properly invest in active travel. But where we know there's a demand for you know, community bus services, let's, let's bring that back. It was worrying when we took evidence on the transport side of things that despite having legislation and powers that councils can use, you know, there was um, you know, no evidence that councillors are going to hit that button and start to run council bus services because they don't have the resource. Now, I know work is happening in government, but that's an area where we need to see, you know, real um, significant improvement. Just briefly, because we know that decarbonising transport and buildings are the key areas, we heard evidence from Stephen Smiley, the vice convener of Unison, um, in terms of what we need to do around retrofitting buildings, he gave this striking example in South Lanarkshire. The cost of retrofitting 
all non-domestic buildings in South Lanarkshire would amount to half a billion pounds. Now, we know the Council doesn't have that in money. Um, we know we need a partnership approach. But again, we need to have answers to these really big um, questions. Just briefly to give a shout out to community wealth building. Again, the government is committed to that approach. But North Ayrshire Council has been pioneering in terms of community wealth building. Um, which we need if we're going to spearhead a community and worker-led just transition. And there were really good examples there around solar energy and um, a, a lot more. Um, what I would say, I know there's been time in hand, but I'm quickly running out of seconds here. I think it's really important that this report isn't given, you know, warm words today and is filed away and then we don't talk about it again. I think for, you know, we're going to have a new First Minister, there may be a new Cabinet and a new approaching government. This is going to help the government. It's going to help Scotland. You know, please, we have to keep looking back at this report and the work of other committees in this parliament because it's the people of Scotland, the experts in Scotland, the communities in Scotland who have informed this work. So we have these fantastic recommendations. As Willie Rennie said, this is hard. Of course it's hard, but we have to do it. And I would say to colleagues as well, when we talk about net zero, because there's a lot to be critical of and a lot to get gloomy about, but we need to give our communities hope that this is possible. Possible. And what keeps me motivated is when I visit schools as often as I can on my eco tour at the moment, and they know what is possible. They know what needs to be done. They want to be part of the solution. They want us to invest in them so that they can be the planners, the engineers, the architects of the future. So hopefully that's a positive note to end on. And I thank everyone who's taken the time to read the report, but don't file it away and forget about it. Thank you, Ms Lennon. I now call Natalie Dawn to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to start by welcoming this report from the committee. As many of us in this chamber agree, climate change is by far the biggest threat to our future, and it is crucial that when it comes to this issue that we work constructively together across the chamber to identify ways that we can deliver net zero in Scotland. As a previous member of the Net Zero Committee, I really enjoyed my time spent in this inquiry, listening to such a wide variety of witnesses giving evidence and reading feedback from a wide range of stakeholders. I was sad to miss the final stages and was keenly looking out for the report being released, and I'm now delighted to be taking part in this debate today. For me, local authorities are and will continue to be absolutely crucial in the delivery of Net Zero, not only because they're at the forefront of delivering many of these policies, but also because they are the ones who know their areas and their communities best. Within the report, Recommendation 22 states that the Scottish Government and COSLA promote models of community engagement on climate change and Net Zero, building on the good work some councils are doing. The effective engagement of communities and community groups drawing on their local knowledge is vital to embed a place-based approach to climate change and net zero at local level. And I know some of my colleagues have touched on this already today. I believe, and the evidence taken during this inquiry reaffirms, that collaboration between local authorities and local communities is key. And I want to focus on the potential that this joint working can have. There were some really great examples of this that were highlighted during the evidence sessions, but I want to use an example from my own constituency to emphasise this. I believe that Renfrewshire Council are leading the way in terms of working with the community and getting that community buy-in. The Team Up to Clean Up campaign, which launched in 2018, has been massively successful and involved the community and the Council taking a joint approach to the scourge of litter. This campaign kicked off asking people to take a pride in their area in an attempt to change behaviours and to change attitudes towards littering. The idea being that if you see people in your community actively picking up litter, it might make you think twice about dropping it in the first place. Now, the campaign began with just a handful of people in each community who took time out their day every day to pick some litter. However, it has grown into so much more than that and has taken on a whole life of its own. There is now not a day that goes by in Renfrewshire where someone isn't litter picking or clearing something out. And we've seen people really taking it to the limits with, for example, riverside clearouts that I can tell you are not for the faint-hearted. So, in mind with that idea of changing attitudes, Renfrewshire Council worked with Renfrew author Ross McKenzie to create the story The Clump's Big Mess, a lovely wee story about a dad who dropped litter, much to his children's dismay, who then had to deal with some tricky consequences until he changed his behaviour. 
And this is the kind of initiative we need to really change attitudes. Now, I know that the climate crisis is not going to be solved by dealing with litter alone. However, this campaign was about so much more than just litter picking. With over 4,000 people now interacting and communicating with the online group, it has become a hub which is not only opening people's eyes to so many more environmental issues, but allowing discussions to take place about how to solve these, allowing different ideas to be shared, promoted and discussed, ranging from varying issues from biodiversity to upcycling to reducing plastic. And what is even more exciting is that this is allowing people to share best practice and equally enabling people from within different communities to explore ways that would work for their own locality. Because we can't forget that what works for one town might not work for the town or the village next door. Every community is unique. Now, this campaign could not have worked without the buy-in from the community, and they deserve such great recognition for their hard work, but also the Council for investing in this and enabling all this to happen. Going forward, we need to ensure that we are aware of best practice going on in local authorities, ensuring that they are supported and promoting it where applicable. So moving on to transport, I was also pleased with the recommendations in the report surrounding transport and active travel. It's clear that changes in transport patterns and behaviours are going to be absolutely pivotal in achieving net zero goals. So the recommendations to create a more joined up and strategic approach to public transport and active travel at a regional level, which are reflective of actual travel and commuting patterns, are welcome. Again, I'm thinking of the decline in bus services in my own constituency, which also has limited rail travel. But this is happening in local authorities across Scotland. The public have fell out with the public transport in many areas due to both the unreliability and the decline in services, and just in general, the unreliability of local services. Councils are best placed to understand the needs of their communities, and we need to work to both incentivise and encourage people back onto public transport. So I'm therefore genuinely excited to see the aims of the Scottish Government's National Transport Strategy, which includes supporting local authorities to look at different ways of delivering these more localised services. Another issue that was raised during the committee evidence sessions was 20-minute neighbourhoods, and this sort of aligns with transport well. They aim to ensure that people within a community can gain access to the services and the facilities that they need within 20 minutes. And this will also be absolutely key in transforming our travel habits. But these will only be achieved with a joined up approach to public transport and active travel. And importantly, we need to ensure that these are built around the needs of the whole community. So I, I am running out of time, so I will move to my closing comments, President Officer. To conclude, I believe that this mammoth inquiry has been extremely useful and will give real scope and real food for thought in terms of our delivery of net zero goals and the creation of the greener Scotland that we all want to see. Thank you, Ms Don. I now call Mark Rusko to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Mr Rusko. Thanks very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I warmly welcome this report by the NZ Committee. I um, enjoy taking part in it. And, and it was certainly the, the longest inquiry I think that I've ever been part of. Um, but I do hope it will provide food for thought across government about how we change, adapt to threats and realise opportunities as we tackle both the climate and the nature emergencies. And, you know, I agree with, with Monica Lennon. You know, th this is a, a report that has a lot of hope in it. There's a hope in here that we can actually tackle climate change by working hard in our communities and realising the opportunities and the, and the energy that is in there in our communities for change. And, you know, we heard some really inspiring examples of climate ambition and leadership from around Scotland. But, you know, at the same time, we also heard about the, the inconsistency uh, between councils, especially when it comes to both setting and planning for climate targets. Now, the latest UK Climate Change Committee report on Scotland's progress emphasised three words delivery, delivery, and delivery. And that means we need to see action on the ground in communities everywhere, not just good examples, but everywhere across Scotland. So it's simply not enough for councils to focus solely on their own buildings, their land, and their vehicles fleets. They must be the bodies that are responsible for overseeing the delivery of area-wide climate targets, not just corporate plans for internal carbon reduction. And yet, through the inquiry, we found that you know, only 53% of councils in Scotland have set area-wide emissions targets. Um, we heard from Freiburg Council in Germany, which has shown exactly the type of climate leadership we need to see adopted by councils across Scotland. 
Now, from active citizen and cross-sectoral participation in decision-making to a dedicated climate neutrality unit embedded in the Council, they, they have really led the way internationally. We need to support councils in Scotland to get into that same space that Freiburg managed to get into, uh, I think, well over a decade ago. Now, I do think that introducing a formal duty for local authorities to report progress in planning action on the ground is going to be absolutely critical if we're to see <coughs> that step change. But with that additional responsibility on councils must come the tools to deliver. And that should include a wholesale reform of local taxation powers to raise income and drive behaviour change through, for example, road user charging or even carbon land taxes. Um, but I also recognise that you know, there does need to be a rebalancing of the conversation between national and local government. And that's exactly why I'll be seeking to get the European Charter Bill reconsidered at the earliest opportunity uh, in this parliament. Now, a number of members have talked about the visits that we had, um, and it was inspiring, uh, in particular, to visit Dundee as part of the inquiry and see the progress that's been made there over many years of climate initiatives. And I think the Council should be applauded for recognising that long-term funding for the voluntary sector is absolutely needed. But I am really delighted that the Scottish Government um, have also recognised that need for long-term investment in the third sector, and particularly the announcement from the Cabinet Secretary earlier that there will be another 20 climate hubs that will be funded in Scotland. And I want to give you an example of, of, of one of these hubs that I, that I hope will be funded, and that's Greener Kirkcaldy, because it's an amazing example of how we can put justice at the heart of climate action. Now, their Cosy Kingdom project is tackling poverty and disadvantage by getting energy advice to people who need it the most. And Fife, as a result, now has the highest number of referrals to Home Energy Scotland of any other council area in Scotland. It's quite remarkable what they've achieved. So this in investment through climate hubs will need to continue to drive change and expand and scale up the work of Greener Kirkcaldy and a range of other organisations um, across Scotland. I really look forward to, to seeing the results of that. Now, councils working in collaboration with communities are well placed to drive real change when it comes to transport as well, and with transport, of course, remaining one of the biggest carbon emitters in Scotland. Now, you know, the national strategies and record investment in active travel are charting an ambitious course towards that 20% reduction in car kilometres. And we saw also throughout this inquiry some brilliant examples of how councils were shaping national policies to fit the communities that they serve. Again, Dundee, Stirling, investing in on-street EV charging. But you know, too often we're also seeing quite antiquated local transport strategies no longer reflecting what communities want or need and no longer reflecting the new priorities that we have in the national transport strategy. Um, but there is a real opportunity here for, for councils to, to change that through, for example, making use of the Transport Act franchising powers and the newly uh, launched community bus fund to transform local bus networks in ways that really start to serve local communities. Um, of course, the climate emergency cannot be separated from the nature emergency. and We've seen record investment through the Nature Restoration Fund. Um, and I'd like to sort of highlight some investment that's been taking place again in, in Fife here, because we've seen £3.3 million of additional funding being granted to nature restoration projects in Fife, um, from community co-design work for new active travel routes along the River Leven, which benefits both active travel and um, biodiversity, to restoring urban meadows across the kingdom. So, you know, we can invest in both the nature and climate uh, emergencies together, working with uh, communities. But the scale of the challenge to 2045 is, is going to require a step change in that relationship from local government and private investors to deliver more of that co-financed decarbonisation projects. And again, I think throughout the inquiry we've heard inspiration from Aberdeen City Council, for example, issuing municipal bonds and a number of other initiatives as well. So there's much to, to read and reflect on in, in this report. We, we don't really have enough time to do that this afternoon, but I think we will continue to come back to this report in the months to come. We have to keep building on these achievements and commitments, and I really look forward to, to continuing that work as a member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. I now call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Can I also start by thanking the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for undertaking the comprehensive range of work that informed their excellent report, The Role of Local Government and Cross-Sectoral Partners in Financing and Delivering a Net Zero Scotland. 
The contributions uh, and debate today have been helpful in analysing many of the key areas that the committee feels need to be addressed so that the Scottish Government is supporting greater empowerment of and meaning, meaningful support for councils as they play a pivotal role in delivering net zero. And of course, this is against the backdrop of, as the committee puts it, unprecedented demands made on resources and skill sets against an extremely challenging financial backdrop. The committee's recommendations focus on a wide range of issues and themes. However, I will focus my contribution on three areas, funding, private investment and planning. Firstly, improving the way local funding is configured so that larger, fewer and more flexible funding streams offer a more holistic and place-based approach response to climate change. And secondly, the need for private investment at scale and the de development of an investment strategy that will increase investor uh, appetite and lead to deals being agreed. And I note the call for an expanded role of the Scottish National Investment Bank and I'm attracted to the proposal that it adds as an interface between local government and investors, essentially supporting contemporary models of co-financing. And I note in their briefing, uh, submitted ahead of today's debate, that COSLA calls for the simplification of national funding for net zero programmes and more core funding for local government to help deliver local and regional net zero projects and programmes. And as a North East constituency MSP, I have spoken to a number of businesses uh, that are ready and waiting to invest uh, in renewables projects, in many cases bringing their vast experience in oil and gas into the renewable sector, but for whom current funding arrangements, in particular uh, yearly funding distribution, is challenging and potentially a disincentive. And I would therefore ask the Scottish Government to consider how funding can be better accessed through more effective co-funding models and that the proposition that the Scottish National Investment Bank acts as a more effective interface between local government and investors be explored further. Thirdly, planning. I note the committee's recommendation on the churn, repetition and delay in the planning process that is impacting major renewables and other projects. And the committee highlights the urgent need to reverse the decline in local authority planners. The complex law sorry, I beg your pardon, the complex nature of planning law and associated lengthy timescales is a pressing issue and one that is further compounded by consenting timescales for new projects. Now, while consenting is a separate process and not one directly considered uh, within the report, nonetheless, I consider it is important to acknowledge the unintended but significant challenge both processes create for businesses. Indeed, I've raised the issue of consenting with the Scottish Government on behalf of businesses in the North East that are eager to invest in projects, but for whom planning and consenting timescales are a major challenge, particularly for offshore wind projects. Now, I note the comments made by COSLA and Scottish Renewables around the need to disentangle aspects of planning law so that we can increase our onshore wind capacity from 8 to 20 gigawatts to meet our 2030 target. Turning to the reduction over the years of staffing within planning departments. I am aware the committee raised this uh, with the Scottish Government in their letter on the draft NPF4, commenting that unless this trend is reversed, there is a risk of NPF4 being more of a wish list than a blueprint for truly transformational change that is urgently needed. And in addressing this issue, I'm drawn to the specific pro proposal that planning could be placed within the tertiary education landscape as a STEM subject. And 
In this regard, I highlight Aberdeen City Council and the work that they are undertaking to develop their senior phase curriculum uh, to align the curriculum to the anticipated demand for skills created by offshore energy production, broaden the pathways available to young people to maximise the use of vocational courses and alternative routes into further and higher education, and importantly develop digital and computing skills and a broader range of computer technology pathways. And I commend the passion and commitment of Eleanor Shepherd, uh, Director of Education uh, at Aberdeen City Council, who has been pivotal in driving this piece of work forward. So, presiding officer, to conclude, many examples of the work uh, already underway in the North East involving council business partnerships ha have already been highlighted by members this afternoon, some in my constituency, including the Energy from Waste Facility and the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub. And I hope that the report uh, de debated today will offer an important opportunity to ensure that future work is indeed secure, deliverable and successful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicol. And I now call Douglas Lumsden, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the committee and clerks for this uh, excellent report. Uh, the sentiment of the report is summed up in the opening paragraph. Scotland will not meet its ambitious target of being net zero by 2045 without a more empowered local government sector, with better access to the skills and capital it would need to play a full role in this energy revolution. The message that comes through this entire report is that local government is key to all of us being able to meet our amb ambition and targets when it comes to environmental responsibility. But this devolved government have abjectly failed in those targets to date. And my colleagues, Morris Golden and Brian Whittle, shine a light on those failures on a weekly basis. Targets missed, funding lost, and local government excluded from the process on schemes such as the deposit return scheme. Schemes that will have a detrimental effect on our council's budget. In fact, Falkirk Council announced in December last year that they would cease their curbside glass collection as it would cost 234,000 in lost revenue once the DRS scheme started. This has huge implications for those who are not able to get to a deposit return location. But it's not just the DRS scheme that is causing Council's concern. The committee report highlights the concerns of rural communities, such as those in the North East, and calls for the Scottish Government to set out what specific assistance will be available to Councils with a large component of rural housing and our island communities where there are additional challenges. With much more demands on transport and car travel in our rural communities, we need answers from this government on how they will support our local authorities to achieve their targets that have been set. I am proud of the fact when I was leader of Aberdeen City Council, we signed a partnership agreement with BP. They become planning and technical advisors, helping shape solutions for the city's net zero path. Working in partnership, BP and Aberdeen City Council explored opportunities like accelerating the adoption of electric and hydrogen-powered city vehicles, energy efficiency programmes for buildings and the circular economy. The task of the partnership is to connect the dots between experts, both within the Council and across BP, to create the very best and most sustainable decarbonisation solutions for the city. And the partnership was strengthened when both organisations signed a joint venture agreement to develop the city's hydrogen hub. And these are exactly the type of agreements we require if we are to succeed to meet our targets. Private and public organisations working together, sharing knowledge and expertise, and of course, attracting investment. And it's that attracting investment piece that is so vital. We all know that council funding and resources are being stretched ever further, and this will make it even more difficult for local authorities to play their part in becoming net zero. Capital spending for local authorities is an issue where there is often a conflict between cost and becoming net zero. Willie Rennie highlighted, highlighted that earlier. In the borders, the new school in Jedra was the first plastic-free school built, with all its furniture and fittings from sustainable sources. But this comes at a price, and it will be harder for local authorities to make the right choice. 
With infl inflationary costs on building, it is now almost impossible for local authorities to make the initial capital outlay required to ensure the highest environmental standards for new buildings. And councils have many responsibilities that link in with the net zero agenda. Transport, housing, economic planning and support, spatial planning and placemaking, the build environment and waste management and recycling. They are vital, but without additional support going to local councils, the Scottish Government will not achieve its net zero targets. They are central to ensuring that these targets are met. 12% of Scotland's housing stock is in the hands of local authorities, and the retrofitting of these buildings to meet these targets is a mammoth task. There is no way our local authorities' partners can hope to achieve these um, ambitious targets without additional support from the Scottish Government. And I've already touched on waste and recycling in terms of the deposit return scheme. However, we know that this is one of the biggest responsibilities of our colleagues in local government. So many of our councils are now moving to longer and longer period between refuse collection due to funding cuts. These cannot be good for our environmental ambitions. And we have seen an increase in fly tipping right across Scotland, a topic that my colleague Murdo Fraser is seeking to address in his proposed private members bill. More support has to be forthcoming to our councils to ensure that they, and therefore all of us, are meeting these important targets towards net zero. Presiding officer, in conclusion, we are all aware that resources are finite, but not only our financial, financial resources, but the resources of our planet. We have to invest now to protect our future. Governments are good at planning for the short term, but often fall short when it comes to planning for the long term. This came through strongly in the evidence to the committee from COSLA. We need to be much better at providing long-term funding solutions to our partners to enable them to take long-term policy dec decisions in relation to our environment. Councils need our support. They need a fair funding settlement that allows them to take the innovative and forward-thinking approach to net zero that we need. We need action rather than just warm words from this devolved government and I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary to accept the recommendations of this committee and move urgently to implement them. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. We will now move to closing speeches, and I call on Mark Griffin to uh, wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Around six minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. As colleagues across this chamber have said, this is a hugely welcome report which acknowledges local government to be at the heart of meeting our climate goals. But it does also set out a series of warnings. And I would welcome the headline response quoted by a number of speakers in the debate this afternoon that councils need more help, that targets will not be met without a more empowered local government with better access to the skills and capital and an understanding of its role. President Officer, fundamentally, the report accepts decisions by this government, including relentless cuts to council budgets and a failure to tackle our wider skills shortages are very real blockers to success. It emphasises that a partnership approach which exists in name only just now between local and national government is vital for success. Now, the, those warnings it gives are absolutely nothing new, so it is then telling that the government have failed to respond to the committee report already. And when it comes to the decarbonisation of heat in our building, it was the committee's acknowledgement that local government is still waiting clarity on its role in relation to private and business properties. And that sentiment is felt right across supply chains and the existing homes alliance have said that, that needs to be addressed, uh, addressed urgently. Householders alongside builders uh, and trades they're crying out for certainty about what they should do, how and when they should invest, or just simply assurances that they're installing the right technology, that that's not going to be overtaken by events, and that government isn't going to come in and say, no, you need to rip that out and um, install something else. But that needs to be done properly, because decisions made in government without a, with a, a lack of adequate planning and support for local communities are contributing to failure right now. I, I recently visited Stornoway and I learnt how badly wrong this government's approach can be, um, affecting vital work to tackle fuel poverty in that island 
community with a huge knock-on effect for the skills and work pipeline, decimating investment in local communities that should be contributing progress towards net zero. Uh, many across the Chamber will know that fuel poverty in the Western Isles was due to hit 80 per cent this winter, and yet it was the short-sighted actions of government that contributed to the collapse of the area-based scheme on the islands when, in March last year, the, the TIG, the, the Council's delivery partner, announced the closure of its insulation, installation department with the loss of 14 jobs. Now, they cited a, an onslaught of changes to regulations brought in by UK and Scottish governments. It said that it was the Scottish government's wholesale adoption of the Westminster standards, which was the key point in that organisation's failure. They said the lack of rural proofing within the past 2035-2030 retrofit standards and a failure by the Scottish Government to flex these standards to make sure they worked for, for homes here, for Scottish housing stock, I certainly will. Uh, the Member's making particular allegations there that the Scottish Government adopted wholesale the UK Government's approach to this particular scheme. Is the Member aware that the, UK, the Scottish Government made repeated representations to the UK Government to amend the scheme so that we could operate it on a Scottish-specific basis to allow us to take into account these aspects, but the UK Government rejected that and we had no option otherwise than to operate their scheme. So despite repeated attempts to try and resolve the issue, the UK Government refused to move on the particular issue. Mark Griffin. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's um, intervention that this is a Westminster design and devised scheme, but that the, the information and advice I have received that the government was under no obligations to replicate, to simply lift that uh, and use that in Scotland. And in fact, the experts, the experts who are involved and have been involved in, in installing insulation services in the Western Isles for many years have stated that this is exactly the reason why they have had to, to end their service. It's absolutely devastated that community's capacity to deliver in the islands. It's meant that since it, it is meant, I, I'll, take, I'll take the member um, in a second because uh, it obviously affects the member's constituency directly, but it's meant that in the member's constituency that since July 2021, there has not been a single installation of insulation and that has seriously undermined the local supply chain. I'll take I'll it. Well, where, where I can agree with the member certainly is that this uh, the, he quotes the, the lack of insulation, obviously under the area-based scheme. Um, but will he acknowledge uh, that the council, who did not run the previous scheme, incidentally, uh, and, the, local, and the, the national government are working together to try and recreate a scheme just now? Clearly, and I have said this many times, it is a bad situation that's been created by the UK government regulations. But everyone now needs to work together to recreate a scheme that will work in the Western Isles. Mark Griffin. I absolutely uh, accept that, but the contention from the experts that I visited in the members' constituency is that the Scottish Government did not need to lift that scheme, that scheme and replicate it in Scotland. That it could have adapted that to um, respond to the, the environmental situation that we have here. But what they have also said is that uh, there has been an absolute failure in government to provide any adequate training so that their staff could train in what the new scheme would look like. When I've asked questions to ministers, they've simply passed the buck to colleges and said it's for further education institutions to set up training schemes rather than take direct responsibility to support the, the organisation and the members constituency who, like I said, have not been able to deliver a single um, insulation installation since July 2021, which I think uh, is absolutely um, shocking. It's choked off. Um, work. It's choked off work for um, local suppliers, and I, I think that's something that should be addressed uh, absolutely urgently. Um, President Officer, I come back to the, my original point um, that this report emphasises that local government must be a key partner, but in making its recent budget bid, COSLA said that it needed £1 billion to stand still just to maintain current services. It emphasised how vital it is to do in the prevention work to keep people away from a, a strained NHS, to continue investment in local authorities, just as it will be in the journey to, to net zero. That will be even harder when budgets are, are cut and the consequences for reaching those targets are, are then absolutely um, 
leave us in a worrying state of affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call on Brian Whittle to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Can I add my gratitude to the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for the comprehensive and really balanced report, which is not often said sometimes <laughs> with committee reports, um, and, and, can I also, and also for giving us the opportunity to discuss such an important topic as delivering a Net Zero Scotland. And it has been a significant debate because it has given this Parliament that opportunity to review how the Scottish Government is doing against their Net Zero targets, targets that will have to be met if we are going to do our bit on keeping 1.5 alive. Presiding yeah. Officer, what we have heard today in evidence from the Committee and from the re recently published review from the Committee on Climate Change is that the Scottish Government are big on targets without the planning and the route map to achieving, achieving those targets. The very opening paragraph in the NZ Committee's report it says it all, and, it has, and I'm, I'm going to repeat it. Scotland will not meet its ambitious targets of being net zero by 2045 without a more empowered local government sector with better access to skills and capital that we need to play a full role in this energy revolution and a clearer understanding of the specific role the Scottish Government wants it to play in, del in delivering in some key areas. Now that, of course, has been backed up by the Climate Change Committee's re recent report, where they say it's still, there are still important gaps at local authority level, which might cause detrimental delays in rolling out a significant policy across the nation. There is a lack of coordination from the Scottish Government, as well as, a, as barriers to properly implementing climate policy that are ingrained in the policy cycle, and they have left local authorities to their own devices to do the best that they can. The resulting risk is net zero policy being rolled out at different speeds depending on the local area. They say there is a combination of an absence of direction from the Scottish Government and a dearth of strategic design and financial support on a local level means that, when there is action, it is often uncoordinated across geographic and political areas. And policy, sorry, policy areas. Local authorities are taking the initiative to drive action where possible, but this should be accompanied by strong direction from the national government, along with the necessary powers at local level. If I move on to the contributions from members, Liam Kerr, uh, uh, he highlighted that lack of direction from the Scottish Government, that setting of major deadlines and targets, but the unacceptably slow delivery of guidance and supports to achieve those targets. He talked about lack of resource, about the cuts today, and I think uh, Colin Smith also highlighted this, the cuts to, to, uh, to councils, with no insight into provision of resources in the longer term. And I have to say, it's not often I'm disappointed by Willie Rennie, but when I asked him the question around that, reply, that need for longer term um, uh, strategy, longer than a parliamentary term, he, was, he, he didn't think that this parliament would be able to do that. But we need to change, because that needs to happen. It, Liam Kerr talked about a lack of skill. Of course, I'll give way to Willie Rennie. Willie Rennie. I, I didn't mean to uh, disappoint Mr Wisher. I was um, just trying to be realistic about what politics is like, I'm afraid. I would love it to be longer term. I would strive for longer term. But I think we just need to understand that we've got a cycle that's quite short. Brian Hoodle. I agree with Willie Rennie that we do have that cycle, but if we're going to hit net zero targets, if we, and we have to hit those net zero targets, this parliament is going to have to work in a different way and we're going to have to start looking longer term. I think the lack of skills planning is something that was, that was highlighted uh, quite a lot uh, by uh, Liam, K uh, Liam Kerr and by Alexander Stewart. We need suitably qualified staff to carry out everything from home retrofit to developing energy efficient strategies. There is already a shortage of staff in key areas, key areas like planning, leading to delays in application for wind farms and other renewable projects that are key to net zero. And Alexander Stewart highlighted the skill shortage now being cited by Homes for Scotland and Scottish Renewables as a major threat to 2030 and 2045. Uh, for targets. And here's one that I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, that my colleague is sitting down, but I have to agree with Jackie Dunbar. It doesn't happen all that often. But this I idea that, that, that we need to, to uh, the green economy has to be woven into our education at the earliest age to ensure that we have a workforce that can deliver on net zero. There's no evidence of this being even thought of, let alone being planning by the Scottish Government. Douglas Lumsden used his extensive knowledge in uh, local government to talk about the impact that the Scottish Government policies have already had on the councils. DRS scheme, which continually gets raised in here, Falkirk abandoning that curbside glass collection. 
He highlighted the particular challenges facing councils with a substantial rural area where the wider geographical spread of housing and the more limited infrastructure can, can create its own additional challenges and added cost. Now, presenting officer, um, Scott, uh, according to the Climate Change Committee, Scotland has failed to achieve seven out of 11 of its targets to date. The trend of failure will continue without urgent and strong action to deliver emissions reductions, and it has to start now. It has to start now. The Scottish Government urgently needs to provide a quantified plan for how its policies will combine to achieve the emissions reductions required to meet the challenging 2030 targets. The plan must detail how each of Scotland's ambitious milestones will be achieved. And, Presiding Officer, this is the crux of the matter. Now, I am totally supportive of targets, of stretch targets. We are, ambition should be applauded and supported. But without a route map, without working with the targets back to a plan, starting from now, these targets are worthless. We know why we have to hit these targets, have to hit these targets, but the Scottish Government now must produce the how. As the NZ Committee's report details, one of the main deliveries of a net zero policy will be our councils. But they are working in a Scottish Government fog of uncertainty. We need our councils to be driving the net zero agenda. The Scottish Government needs more than targets and high level objectives. They need to ensure there is adequate funding for these policies. Time is running increasingly short, and it's time for the Scottish Government to get serious on the targets, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Pluto. I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Around eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I've listened with interest to uh, contributions across the Chamber this afternoon. And what, as I said in my open remarks, is a very helpful report and a very timely report as well, highlighting uh, a number of the key actions and measures that need to be taken forward in order to help to support our colleagues in local government. Uh, to tackle climate change, but I think actually, as the report recognises, that some of the contributors this afternoon have also recognised, in particular, an intervention that was made by Fiona Hislop. My own contribution is the nature of how you empower local authorities so that you take a place-based approach to finding the solutions that are right for those individual communities. And one of the things that I would challenge some of the contribu contributors to this particular debate on is this idea that. The Scottish Government just need to do X, Y and Z, and that will magically improve things for local authorities in tackling these issues and will ensure a consistency of approach across the country. In fact, that would be the wrong thing to do. What we need to do is to empower local authorities to be able to make the decisions that are right for their local communities and to empower local communities within local authority areas in order to influence that process as well. Collectively, together, let me make some progress. First of all, Mr Whittle, and I'll come to you. But let me see, make sure that we are about empowering communities and allowing them to make decisions that are right for their needs in how they meet the challenges that go with tackling climate change. Now, a couple of key themes have uh, come up during the course of the debate. So the issue of uh, planning and the resources around aspects of planning were raised by Colin Smith, Willie Rennie, uh, Alexander Stewart, Audrey Nicholl, uh, and Monica Lennon, uh, and a number of others. And members will recognise the significant progress that's now been made with MPF4 in making sure that climate and nature is front and centre within our planning decision-making process now. And those who are within our renewable energy sector, those who are within uh, very many of the areas that are committed to tackling the uh, nature crisis which we are facing as well, have warmly welcomed the way in which MPF4 fundamentally turns the dial towards tackling climate change and biodiversity loss, which is why, in putting that in place, we have also given that commitment to take forward work as we are at the present moment with heads of planning, with RTPI uh, and the planning school for implementation of the future, planner, uh, future planners report, which includes the provision of an apprenticeship scheme to address this very issue specifically. But this is not just about helping to support the need to tackle local planning issues. It is also to help to support what will be some of the big strategic infrastructure investments that will be necessary in order to unlock our renewable potential which will require significant planning aspects to go alongside that particular issue. Sorry, do you want to give 
To Colin, make an intervention. Colin Smith. Happy to give way. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept, though, that we have seen a reduction of 38 per cent in budgets for planning departments and a quarter of planning department staff since 2009? And the big fear is that if we can't get it right for, for example, onshore wind projects, and I gave the example of those delayed in Dumfries and Galloway, we have an even bigger challenge when it comes to the scale of those offshore wind projects because we do not so have the staff. I, 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 I recognise the particular challenge, which is making it is important that. It's important that we make sure that there are resources and that local authority are also providing the resources which are necessary in order to meet these needs. And I was interested by the stats that were published today, just last year, actually the headcount within, uh, within local authorities actually increased uh, in terms of the number of people which they, they employ, uh, even within the present financial environment. So we need to make sure that the resources that are necessary in local authorities are also going to the areas which are a priority for them as well. And planning is clearly one of those specific areas. And I've mentioned the work which we're undertaking just now, but also the work which we're taking forward from a, a national level uh, between heads of planning with the energy sector, the Scottish Government, in making sure that we're looking at how we can help to ensure the efficiency of the planning process when these big strategic planning aspects uh, uh, for uh, infrastructure investments are coming forward. Now, a number of members raised the issues around uh, here in buildings, which is a, uh, a key issue. And I, I do need to take uh, issue with the member around the issue in Western Isles. The area-based scheme is a UK government-based scheme. We repeatedly, for over a year, asked them to adapt the scheme, to bring, allow us to bring forward regulations that would adapt the scheme specifically to address Scotland's needs. And despite I was involved in some of the correspondence as well, and despite repeated attempts to try and achieve that, we were unable to get that. And actually, the UK government left it right to the very last minute, uh, which left us with no space or option to do anything other than to adopt their scheme. And the consequence was felt in the Western Isles as a result of that in tragedies by the UK government, that failure to respond to us for what at times felt like almost a year to this particular issue that led to the crisis that we've had in the Western Isles, which is why we're working with the local authority to try and help to recover that situation. But to simply suggest that this was just something that we didn't really bother ourselves to deal with pro effectively is simply wrong. Uh, and the correspondence and the repeated attempts to try and do so will demonstrate that. But the issue of heat and buildings, I think Willie Rennie raised a really important issue here in highlighting the type of challenges that can be experienced at a local authority level. And it feeds into an issue that I want to come back to, and that is on skills. So in terms of, for example, the experience that the member, I think it was in Cooper, uh, in Fife, he mentioned the possibility of developing a, uh, a district heating system, a uh, heat network that could have been alongside a new development in the local authority, and to some degree been quite indifferent about it. Um, I don't know which year that was, but we are now in a position where we obviously have the district heating legislation in place that creates the legislative framework uh, to give clarity to that. But also through the ELHIS programme, the need for local authorities now to have strategic heat decarbonisation plans in place by the 31st of December this year, which is a five-year programme that is to help to support the very issue that Alexander Stewart was raising, and that was the issue of skills, and to give that clear pathway so that the industry know where the work is coming from in order to help to support where they can invest in skills and where they know the opportunities will be as well. And that's to address the type of issue that Willie Rennie raised, which was unacceptable, to make sure that we have that. And to add to that, we're also taking forward specific work now with the Scottish Futures Trust in order to try and prevent the circumstances, because we believe that heat networks will play an important part in the decarbonisation of domestic premises, but so that we avoid getting into trying to reinvent the wheel 32 different times that we can have a framework approach to how we do this so that local authorities can turn directly to the Scottish Futures Trust for some expertise and support in rolling forward programmes around areas such as district heating systems and heat networks, which again will help to support them in that way uh, as well. I am not sure how much time I have. Uh, a, a brief intervention and a brief response would probably be in order. I will give way to uh, Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful that you gave way. And I, I realise you're coming to the end of your speech. My question was a very simple one. Could you give the committee some indication when you are going to respond to the report? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I hope, Zain Officer, uh, to be able to respond to uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, once we've finalised our approach to it. And the reason it's taken longer than I would have wanted it to is because we're taking a cross-governmental approach to it because of the wide-ranging nature of it, which has meant we've had to draw in information 
and a response from a whole range of different directorates on it. So uh, that's the principal reason for that, and I can assure the member that we will provide a, a full response to uh, the committee's report, as I would always uh, seek to do, given the nature of the uh, important work they undertake. Can I also, uh, President Officer, though, uh, enjoy my remarks to a close? Uh, say that um, I recognise the, the challenge within this report and other reports from the CCC around the work and the actions that the Scottish Government have got to take forward in tackling climate change. But I also recognise the role that local authorities and communities have to play in helping to support that. We collectively, almost unanimously, supported our climate change targets um, of 75% net zero by 2030, net zero by 2045. But we also have a responsibility to have a mature and considered debate on how we go about changing that transition. It is very easy just to say uh, the government should do X, Y and Z whenever they think they should do it, but actually it is much more difficult to put policy into action. And when I hear colleagues across this chamber saying we need to give more powers to local authorities and assistance to be able to do these things, when we gave them the simple power of being able to introduce a workplace parking charge, uh, we actually got opposition from a whole range of parties in here saying they should not have that power. Yeah. They shouldn't be empowered to make that decision if it's the right thing for them to do in tackling climate change within their area. So, President Officer, in welcoming and acknowledging the importance of this particular report and the well-considered recommendations within it, there is also a need for everyone in this chamber to recognise the need to make sure that we take collective action, that we also show collective responsibility and that we recognise that difficult decisions will have to be made in meeting our climate change targets, but that requires a maturity of debate and a recognition that we all have to play our part in achieving that target, rather than simply descending into political opposition when it counts. And I believe that if we can get that level of maturity, we can support our colleagues in local government and our local communities, and we can achieve our net zero targets Thanks. by 2030 and 2045. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Fiona Hislop to wind up the debate on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Up to nine minutes, please, Ms Hislop. Presiding Officer, uh, climate change and our collective role of delivering net zero and elimination of carbon emissions is a global imperative, but to deliver it, we need action at every level of government. This has been a good debate. It raises so many issues. It has challenged us, but also given us some hope and confidence. I too would like to thank all those who sent in submissions and gave evidence from financiers like the Association of British Insurers to community groups, from city councils to environmental groups, from planners to transport and housing private companies. Uh, thank you to our clerks and Spice who provided excellent assistance to steer us through almost a year of evidence and inquiry. And despite joining our committee at the end of the inquiry, our convener, Edward Mountain, steered us well to conclusion. The power of the report is its breadth of approach, but compact output and brief, sharp focus of recommendations are there to help government. Targets matter, but it's delivery which will make the difference. And the Climate Change Committee's last report was crystal clear about Scotland's need for a step change in setting out delivery plans, as Mark Ruskell emphasised. And it is worth repeating the top line of the Net Zero Committee's report. Scotland will not meet its ambitious target of being net zero by 2045 without a more empowered local government sector, with better access to the skills and capital it will need to play a full role in this energy revolution and a clearer understanding of the specific role the Scottish Government wants it to play in some key delivery areas. So some lazy thinking and reporting and indeed the initial response from the Government and some indeed in this debate assumed that the access to capital meant it all had to be public capital which is far from the mark. We make clear in our report that access to private capital will be key, but the financial skills, the product development for market investment is far from mature and needs coordination and sharing of financial skill sets to access the billions of pounds of institutional finance available. The uh, briefly. Fine, Mr. Very grateful for the member giving way. Would she then, uh, if, if a, summati a summation there would be that if governments uh, responsibility to set the targets, to set that framework and set the set a strategy going forward that gives confidence for that investment to come into net zero targets. That is the very uh, point of the uh, recommendation of a roadmap, which I think we're all agreed on. 
The response from COSLA was that our report was a watershed moment in understanding and appreciating local government's role in, and potential in delivering net zero. Now, there is no shortage of willingness and good examples of best practice and drive and understanding of what needs done, as I saw in visiting Stirling, but it is far from comprehensive all over Scotland. To get where we need to be, we need the examples of the best being delivered at scale all over Scotland. Councils are major employers with significant ownership of buildings and land themselves and as such, like any other public or voluntary organisation, need to in-house realise net zero with their own assets. But that cannot and must not be the limitation of their role. As Colin Smith set out, councils are uniquely placed to lead, coordinate and deliver all the different players and services in their geographical locality in a deep and comprehensive way. They have unique convening power. And it is that that we strongly advise government needs to be harnessed and coordinated uh, with co-production in a way that to date the government just hasn't done. We also call for the Scottish Government to ensure that all councils set area-based targets rather than targets only for their own direct emissions. Only 53% of councils currently do this. So yes, local government is independent, but they themselves are strongly of the view and ask that the Scottish Government take on that far more of a role in a Team Scotland delivery model. We need to shift from piecemeal projects to strategic delivery model with changes in, in incentive style and timeframe of funding and decision making to make this happen. Paul McLennan spoke well on this in relation to heat and buildings and what this will mean for a proposed new deal for local government. Audrey Nicholl spoke of the style and form of funding and co-financing. So our main recommendations are for the Scottish Government to provide a comprehensive roadmap for delivery of net zero in key areas, one that also gives councils far more certainty than they have at present about the roles they are to play. For the Scottish Government to create a local government facing climate intelligence unit to provide specialist help, and I'm pleased that Michael Matheson has accepted this, to have, for, to have far uh, fewer um, and more flexible challenging funding streams uh, for net zero projects, larger in form but perhaps more strategic to be help that place-based response. And for the Scottish Government to address the, the churn, the repetition and delay in the planning process that is holding up major renewables and other projects to help meet net zero goals and has a chilling effect on investment. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary, MPF4 will make a, a big change in that direction. And also for the long-term decline in the numbers of council employed planners to be reversed um, uh, to meet the ambitions of the new national planning framework. And for the Scottish Government to clarify the role councils will play in that area-based approach to heat decarbonisation and to set out the additional support that will be offered in pre preparation and delivery of those local heat and energy efficiency strategies. So there are plenty other recommendations, but if the Scottish Government were only to deliver these ones, we would make a big difference to how and therefore when we deliver net zero. Now, I want to touch on a few areas in particular mentioned by others in this debate and respond to them. Uh, on finance, the Green Finance Task Force needs to provide practical, deliverable assistance on skills. People are a premium here, and we face a perverse situation where private businesses need council planners to deliver approvals at a pace to make a difference, but councils often lose planners to better pre playing uh, private practice. And that 38% reduction in town planners since 2010 is of concern. It was mentioned by Alexander Stewart and Monica Lennon brought her professional expertise in this. And the government and SES need to accept the RTPI's detailed case for a chartered town planner apprenticeship scheme. So advice is available from local government improvement service and the Scottish Futures Trust and the Scottish National Investment Bank, but they can do more here. But it's not just advice, but also secondment of access to experienced staff to deliver projects which is needed. Liam Kerr talked about the need for uh, plans and certainty so private business have confidence to deliver on private skills investment. Regional transport uh, partnerships need to do more across council boundaries for public transport and particularly buses for commuters. That was raised by Natalie Don. On community, I welcome the Scottish Government's announcement today of £4.3 million um, for 20 new climate change hubs for community-led work. On housing, now Willie Rennie set out the very real decisions and choices of upfront costs for energy efficient houses versus volume of new housing and, and who bears the risk and he said change is hard and he's right. 
Monica Lennon spoke of aligning procurement and Net Zero, and Douglas Lumsden addressed procurement and the real choices and dilemmas faced by councils. And on recycling and waste, Jackie Dunbar referenced the council-led Aberdeen uh, and Shire Energy and Waste Plant. Presiding officer, we are all MSPs sent here to serve our constituents and our country. I might add that we're here also to serve our planet and the people of this nation and others so that we can have a sustainable future. The window on that world we know is closing and the world we don't fully know or understand of constant adverse weather, of flooding, rising sea levels on ours and other shores, of millions of climate migrants from drought, is fast in coming. This world is not abstract, it is of now, so the imperative for climate change mitigation, adaptation and carbon reduction is also of now. <laughs> Delivery needs to be now, and we need to mobilise all of our talents across this land to do this. Change, as Willie Rennie said, is hard, and that demands that we work together. And it is in that spirit that I commend this report and this debate to Parliament. And if this is the challenge across this chamber, we work not just for the next four years or the four years after that, we work for the long term. I think that challenge may be hard, but I think that this Parliament can rise to that and work with our partners in local government in delivering it. Thank you, Ms. Hislop. That concludes the debate on the role of local government and its cross-sectoral partners in financing and delivering a net zero Scotland. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8228 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 8228 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament uh, is agreed. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8229 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moved. Uh, no member has asked to speak uh, uh, on the motion, uh, and therefore I uh, put the question that motion 8229 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is therefore agreed, and the motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 8230 on suspension of standing orders. I ask George Adam, Minister, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. And moved, President Officer. And I call Neil Bibby. Thank you, Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to oppose the suspension of Standing Order 15.2.1 that will close the public gallery tomorrow, Wednesday, 15th of March 2023. This is the second time a similar motion has been put to this chamber in a matter of weeks as a result of our parliamentary staff lawfully withdrawing their labour. It was wrong uh, previously to shut the public gallery, and it is wrong now. As I have said before, in excluding the public from this Parliament's meetings, we are in direct contradiction of not just the founding principles of this Parliament, but also of the Scotland Act too. Therefore, we should reject this motion. We should not be casually casting aside these principles of openness and accountability whenever they are inconvenient, especially when they are viable alternatives, just as our colleagues in the Welsh Senate have shown. Regardless of your views, on the industrial action. Surely we should all agree, as parliamentarians and Democrats accountable to the people of Scotland, that this measure to close the public gallery is wrong. We are now further down a slippery slope where it is deemed convenient to shut the people out of their parliament, and therefore I move against this motion. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I call on George Adam, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Parliament is sitting tomorrow and the corporate body has recommended that the public gall gallery closes due to staffing levels. And I accept that recommendation from the corporate body, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. In fact, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 8205.1, in the name of Daniel Johnson, which seeks to amend motion 8205 
in the name of Ivan McKee on trade, Austria and New Zealand bill, UK legislation be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. Uh, the Parliament is not agreed and there will be a division. And uh, we will now move to a vote. There will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.